power session on automation Silurian transition and mid polyzoic biodiversity. Our first speaker will be Oliver Lehner from ARI and Bloom University. And I'm really happy that uh, he agreed to give us a keynote talk on the early polyzoic, a time of dramatic climatic, environmental and evolutionary changes. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation, <coughs> Mike, and uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm happy that uh, now so many uh, could come uh, to this uh, talk. I heard from Mike that uh, many people already seem to have disappeared. So <laughs> well, actually, the hardest problem if I talk about the early period talk is really to make a selection of slides because there are so many dramatic things happening. And uh, well, just to start with the paleogeography, uh, well, we during the Paleozoic, we still have the on ongoing uh, disruption, uh, the continuation of the disruption of Rodinia, and we have uh, Laurentia mainly in, in this tropical position all the time. And uh, what's also one of the dramatic events is that we have the Caledonian collision between uh, Laurentia and Baltic Isis. So just to show you, this is one of the old uh, uh, sketches of Wellington and Moose showing the uh, disruption of the supercontinent and uh, the increase in diversity just to start with this. Uh, diagrams and uh, well, uh, during the early Paleozoic, we had two major yeah, explosions in life. Uh, one is the Cambrian explosion on uh, higher uh, taxonomic uh, uh, stages, and uh, the other one is which really took a lot of attention over the last decade, let's say, the Ordovician explosion where we really have a, a dramatic increase in diversity uh, on the genus level and so on. So, uh, well, then uh, of course uh, uh, if, uh, we, if we have a look to people dealing with databases uh, and using the paleobiology database, it looks like that we have this kind of a continuous uh, evolution from Cambrian uh, uh, through Devonian with a continuous increase in, uh, in diversity. But, uh, well, uh, this is also illustrated uh, by Klug and others when they have been talking about the Necton revolution uh, uh, when we go from the Neoproterozoic uh, over the Cambrian or the Vision to the Devonian that we have uh, certain different uh, different evolutionary steps uh, and here we have the <coughs> biodiversification uh, and this leads <coughs> then also to this Necton revolution later on. But uh, well, if we go to the databases of the different paleontologists, of course, uh, we see that there are, this is not a continuous uh, diversity trend we have uh, like <coughs> here with the ad order vision extinction. So we have also two of the major extinction events, uh, two of the big five within the early Paleozoic, one in the in the order vision, and order vision, and then in the Devonian. And uh, well, if, if we look into the literature, uh, this order vision biodiversification event uh, was uh, also uh, assumed <coughs> to represent one of the major explosions in life uh, during the Phenostoic history. So, uh, also, just to show you that uh, it is not really just such a trend, there are these really drawdowns in evolution and in diversity, but it, it's not that simple that we just have, uh, at the end of the order vision, uh, a major breakdown. We have now, uh, and I will talk quite a bit about climate in the following, we have a couple of uh, glaciations and uh, several, uh, several uh, smaller uh, extinctions. And this is just 
some of the diagrams you can find in the literature. This is recently uh, done by Dave Harper and others showing that there are here in red, these are the extinctions, that there are a couple of extinctions going on across the uh, Ordovician Silurian transition uh, within these taxa. So uh, when we think about uh, all these radiations, extinction events, and uh, what really triggers the establishment of uh, all these ecosystems, so of course we have all these traditionally uh, used uh, triggers the, such as plate tectonics, but this of course uh, only can uh, show the long trends. We have this uh, gigantic ash faults. Uh, for example, the Ordovician was the time interval of the most dramatic uh, ash faults in the Phanerozoic. I will also come back to that later on. And uh, but what's what's really uh, one of the uh, main interesting things is if we compare climate versus uh, radiation and also versus extinction events. And then, of course, we also have to consider the ecological effect. So, uh, especially if we think uh, about the development uh, in the food chain, uh, what happened in the primary production, what did this cause in the trophic pyramids, and uh, what we also can see is an uh, increase in complexity within the food web and uh, also uh, complexity uh, in uh, ecosystems such as really modern uh, type uh, reef systems uh, coming up in the upper Ordovician. So, but just to go a little bit back in time, it's, uh, if we if we think about the Cambrian explosion, so of course uh, it got very also shown uh, with uh, the molecular clock data, and what is also known from a little bit from the fossil record is that of course this kind of development uh, is uh, it's a little bit artificial because this, uh, the ranges should go further down into the name Proterozoic. And uh, this is shown by all the kind of uh, diagrams where we see the fossil record and how far back we could expect uh, more or less the first occurrence of these. But, uh, yeah, what caused the Cambrian explosion? There have been many different, uh, many different uh, triggers mentioned. Uh, just to, to show one of them is, uh, for example, that we had this continental inundation in, uh, in the Proterozoic, and then uh, during, uh, this, uh, during uh, the early Cambrian, a lot of nutrients and phosphate and uh, coxide came into, into the oceans, and this of course should have triggered uh, uh, the Cambrian explosion, and th there are also lots of other causes mentioned, like higher uh, oxygen values and so on. And this just came out uh, last week, uh, this is uh, from Paul Smith and Dave Parker, that they said all, all these kind of uh, major events, they are somehow interconnected. It's not just a continental flooding with the erosion of uh, the regoliths and bringing in calcium and phosphate into the sea. It's just uh, some kind of a real complex uh, framework which triggers uh, these things. And here, here we see this is uh, this time interval where we have this major diversification and uh, so I would like to say that this is probably true for, for all these other events also in the Paleozoic. Of course, one factor might be dominant at certain times, but we really should consider what could be, uh, you know, uh, a trigger in addition. So if, if we look uh, to the carbon uh, record and the oxygen record uh, across this uh, uh, across the Cambro Ordovician boundary, or uh, in the in the transitional part of the Cambrian to the Ordovician. So in the uppermost Cambrian, we have the spice event, which is known worldwide and which uh, uh, reflects uh, most probably a, a real explosion in uh, primary production. And before, uh, the oxygen values show really uh, 
some kind of uh, dramatic cooling, so maybe that this was just a deglaciation and uh, we bring, uh, we have uh, some bloom at this time. And uh, this uh, kind of plankton revolution uh, is also by uh, Salzman and others uh, a possible trigger for the great Ordovician biodiversification event. But there are, of course, uh, yeah, uh, this kind of plankton evolution, I think, uh, also plays a major role, and we we also uh, talked about that in in China at the Nanjing meeting, at the Ordovician meeting, and asked us uh, if uh, this uh, evolution of the of the plankton uh, triggered uh, the diversification. And uh, well, what we also uh, think is that this kind of plankton evolution. Uh, across this auto uh, Cambrian, Cambrian auto vision transition, uh, also triggered the plantography in different larvae, in different groups, and uh, they went out into the open ocean, and so new ecosystems uh, opened up, and uh, they of course also triggered. Uh, they also uh, triggered then uh, the development of the bending suspension feeders <coughs> and this of course went up to the top of the food chain and uh, also the nectonic organisms uh, had their profit. So uh, this may result uh, uh, also in this uh, plantonic uh, uh, development. So just to show you, uh, this, these are uh, Time currents uh, we investigated uh, from uh, from this investigation of uh, all these collections uh, came out that plantotrophy uh, in uh, the model uh, started to occur at the Cambro Autovision transition, and uh, this is one of the rare cases where this uh, falls together with the uh, with the molecular clock data. Uh, yeah, by Peterson, uh, where he also shows around this Cambro autovision transition uh, a set of uh, planktonic larvae coming up. So, uh, but now I want to jump to the climate, which is also a major factor for the Paleozoic. And when I started uh, studying geology, of course, at these times. Uh, we, we had this kind of picture that the, the Paleozoic was just a very, very long greenhouse interval with just a short break with the Hanansian glaciation. And uh, if you think about these papers by Branchley, not too long ago, uh, he assumed that this was just 500,000 years that there was this glaciation going on. Now when we, when we look to the development in isotopes, here just an example of the compilation by Matt Salzman uh, in the geological time scale. So we, we see a lot of events from, K, from the Cambrian to the Devonian. And also if we go further, uh, oh, uh, this is problem with the animation. Uh, well, uh, Trotter et al. shows in science that there is, uh, there is some kind of a dramatic cooling uh, during the order vision and also assumed that this cooling may have triggered this uh, uh, Gobi, this uh, great order vision biodiversification event. Now we have uh, more data. This is an old diagram we filled in, but what you can see is that there are in the upper order vision, these values are extreme, extremely colder than in the lower order vision. So one per mil is about 40 degrees Celsius shift. And here we have a couple of glaciations in the upper order vision uh, by isotopes, but also proved by other uh, sedimentological uh, features. And then we have a set of uh, glaciations in the Silurian. So it's really not a time interval where nothing is happening. And uh, of course, uh, at the same time, I will not go into terrestrialization. I just wanted to mention it because, of course, uh, terrestrialization and the evolution of land plants also caused that uh, uh, carbon dioxide was taken out of the atmosphere. And this is also a major climatic factor. But let's just go back to 
uh, to some of these uh, diagrams, and there are also, of course, uh, models uh, like uh, this by Nadine and others. People started to model uh, the distribution of, uh, of plates was used, and they came up, uh, Nadine and others came up with an idea that here during uh, during the middle order vision up to mid Silurian, we had quite cold temperatures which is uh, in accordance with our data. Uh, we have even a, a glacial based on, on the isotopic data with a shift of 2 per mil, uh, which means uh, a decrease in seawater temperatures in the mid latitudes and uh, also in the subtropics of uh, 8 degrees Celsius. So uh, you can see this is a long <coughs> interval where we have quite cool temperatures. Just to show you one example uh, for uh, with the sedimentological expression, what we see in the tropics and subtropics uh, is quite often that we see paleocarst development during these glacial intervals, and this is a, a mid, this mid Cacian interval where we clearly see from the isotopes that it's a glacial. So uh, we have karstification all across the. Uh, all across the Baltic platform, no matter uh, what kind of facies, except in, in the deeper basin, uh, we, can't, we can't see this type of course. But what uh, at, at this time also, uh, we, can, we can see from the drill course, this is just an example from Estonia, that we can map paleo valleys, uh, which are later infilled uh, by by the, the sediments uh, flooding, uh, flooding the shelf, uh, the Fieka shale, and the same expression, expression uh, of the Fieka shale transgression we see here in North America uh, on top of the Eureka Quartzite, we have the Ely Springs Dolomite and uh, the Hanson Creek, and this is uh, dramatic uh, deepening, very uh, dramatic deepening. And so we also are starting to trace our glacials uh, across, and it's also what, what we saw then is that this uh, first uh, really dramatic cooling falls into periods where we have uh, the major ash folds uh, in the order vision. And uh, so uh, there are these gigantic ash folds that are a thousand times uh, higher than what we know from recent times like Pinatubo and so on. So for some of these ashes, uh, 1,000, more than 1,500 uh, cubic kilometers like for the mill brick were calculated. So this is also, uh, it may be one of the triggers that we had a, a major change in, in climate during the late middle order uh, to the upper order vision. And this is exactly this time interval when we are running into these glaciations. So uh, if we look to this trend uh, from uh, water temperatures in, in the Trevor division to cold temperatures uh, across the Ordovician Salurian uh, boundary and uh, a little bit before and after, so what we can see is, and this is just a compilation by survey and all, uh, of the different groups, we can uh, see an increase in diversity and this is of course very uh, simple sketches that we put just this glaciation and we see, uh, I know there are problems with the Sepkowski data but the trend is pretty clear and this nice catch is always used to show the major trends. So we just put the glaciation here or here in, in the curve done by Webby in 2004 in his book. And also if you look to uh, reef systems, diversity of biotic reef systems, the data Wolfgang Kisling published in 2002, this falls in, in a time frame where we have uh, the most diverse reef systems. So just, uh, this is uh, in, in this Honorosoic Reef pattern, we see this in, in the Webby uh, uh, article also with his compilations that in this upper part we get highly diverse reef systems. And uh, this is just to show it in a very simple way. In the lower order vision we have this kind of more micro-dominated reefs or you know, with sponges and uh, uh, algae and then we, we 
go in, in the middle and late order mission we go into really complex rig systems. Just to show you that also the Silurian, when I, I studied geology, everybody told me in the Silurian nothing is happening. So now we know a little bit more and that uh, lots of things are happening. We have detailed isotope first. We know that there have been a couple of glacial events and uh, some of them are also proved on Gondwana, uh, the, uh, the papers by Rodriguez uh, Martinez and others showing uh, in, uh, in South America uh, that uh, up to the Venlog we have slides uh, dated by archetypes and so on. And uh, I want to, yeah, I mean, this is just the architecture of different events, so there are detailed studies. And I just want to focus on two of them. I will now talk about the Eurydice event, which uh, is a, a glacial event, <coughs> and then also about a hot house in the upper, uh, in the upper Silurian, where we run into really hot temperatures. So just to start with uh, the Eurydice event, which is uh, in in the uh, Wikipedia in Estonia, we had a detailed record, and we shift. We shift here in uh, really uh, high values, which means uh, we uh, run into the glaciation. And here are here are all these extinction events. And I want to just show you that uh, most of most of these events, and you could see here, there are in different groups there are different values of extinction, of course. But what we can see is, it's not the time of the glaciation where uh, all these events take place, it's the time of the climatic perturbations before the glaciation, which obviously stress the environment. And uh, this is an example from the other Silurian, so uh, the Fiji Frida and, uh, and other friends and colleagues, we look to the isotope distribution here in the classic uh, stratotype section uh, in Koshari, and what we can see is that here with these uh, very low values we have the hottest temperatures in, in the uh, Silurian, and uh, uh, this is also an interval uh, of monotraptus transgradients which is uh, well known for quite a while that there are uh, fire events going on at this time, but uh, it, it was also a little bit depending on, on which group you have been working, where you really located the event. Anyway, it, it looks like that this is a time interval where we have really warm temperatures, and at this time, this is for example a cephalopod diversity, we can see that it breaks down and that there is there is quite a, a high extinction rate here and that for a while there are almost no innovations. And yeah, it, it, I don't want to go into these details in the literature. This event uh, you can find under different names. Uh, this warming caused, of course, uh, flooding on northern Gondwana, for example, so we find some kind of uh, black shales and stuff uh, in, in northern